Hi. Hi. Um, let's wait for a couple of minutes till others join. Hey everybody, um, I put something in the, uh, the chat window. There's going to be a template I'm going to use later on uh, to go through. Uh, so you can go to that link. You should be able to download it. And then you can open that in your Google Colab or your Jupyter Notebook, whatever you're, you're using. I recommend Google Colab. It makes everything super easy. I know that this is going to work in, in Google Colab. That's what I'm using this for. So, yeah. Okay. Um, let me start with uh welcoming you all so hello everyone welcome and thanks for joining the programming seminar series um i'm yasasya batugedara a professional development chair for the graduate student government this year um so we are uh organizing uh this programming seminar series for the first time and today is the first day of the programming seminar series um so you can use the chat feature if you want to ask some questions and uh, you can ask the questions at the end as well. You can unmute yourself and ask the questions or you can raise your hand, um, then I can unmute you uh, to ask the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you want to know about know more about the previous events and previous seminars we organized, you can use the GSG website and uh, you can uh, have a look at the upcoming seminar, seminars and workshops as well. And we would like to have uh, your feedback about this seminar series. So you can um, contact me uh, using this email, gsg-prodev at ntu.edu. So, I guess everybody's ready to start the day one introduction to machine learning with Python. So Dr. Ha Timothy Havens will um, share uh, his screen. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. So I'll let you do, go ahead. Hello everyone, this is so exciting. Um, it's been a long time since I've uh, given a class, like feels like forever ago. Um, so I'm gonna keep this um, pretty simple. And I, I, yeah, I looked over the, the guest list. I know that some of you are pretty advanced at machine learning already. So you may find this to be fairly elementary. However, you may learn something too. So um, feel free to stick around and if you leave, I won't notice and so I won't feel bad. So um, first I'm gonna just give a little bit of an introduction to like what machine learning is, assuming, cause I'm just gonna assume that there's some people on this call, a lot of people maybe, um, who may not have ever had an experience with machine learning, um, even though everybody has, because if you own a phone, you definitely have machine learning in your pocket, so. Um, I have some slides I'm going to talk about, then I'll have a Google Colab notebook that I'm going to work from. This notebook should work if you have a local Jupyter notebook uh, with Python going to, um, although I can't promise it does, I will promise that it works with Google Colab. There's a link in the, in the chat where you can download 
the, the template that I'm going to use. And then we're going to go through that together and do some coding together. Um, I tried to keep, you know, the amount of typing that we have to do to a, to a minimum, but you're going to definitely have to do some thinking. So let me get to my PowerPoint. Okay. Introduction to machine learning with Python. So Python is a programming language. It's kind of the uh, programming language du jour, uh, the most fashionable programming language for machine learning. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, it's pretty easy for beginners uh, to get going with Python. The syntax is, is rather straightforward. It's rather forgiving. Um, the tools that are available are pretty good. The resources are really good. The internet is just full of Python resources. Um, it's open source and free. Uh, and so it's great. I mean, uh, it's much better than MATLAB and MATLAB costs a ton of money. So, so first, you know, what is machine learning? So, you know, before machine learning came around, you know, computers were kind of programmed and models were made by hand and hard coded. So if you wanted to create a autopilot for your aircraft, um, then you did a whole ton of physics. You programmed that autopilot to be an optimal control system, and then you, you know, you you made that rigorous and and rugged and robust all the great R words, and you put that in your aircraft, and it worked great. Um, however, you know that if you then change something about the aircraft, you have to redo that whole process. So, you know, things that are made by hand and hard coded, they might work very very well because you've done a ton of research and spent a lot of money creating them, but they're they're not flexible. And so that's kind of where machine learning comes in, is that you know, machine learning has given us this tool where computers now can program themselves and interact with the environment. And they do this by that interaction. So whether the computers start from scratch and just start interacting with the environment to optimize some objective, say to become the best Go player in the world, which is Go is like a checkers, um, or the best poker player in the world, whatever it happens to be, um, the computers can learn. And so really what machine learning is, is a set of tools and a set of mathematics and theory such that computers can take historical information or information that was collected in the past or information that is gathering online or in real time and, and learn how to make decisions from that data. So it's taking data, creating a model, and with that model, then being able to make some kind of decisions, whether that decision is a prediction, uh, a measurement, um, whatever it happens to be. Data to the decisions is something that we like to say quite a bit in machine learning. So there's a lot of enabling trends. Um, so algorithms and theory, certainly, you know, there's all the mathematics and the statistics of the past uh, have come together to produce mach machine learning like every other modern science. And really, the, the big enabler is the flood of data. Basically, everything is measured these days. You know, there are millions of cameras throughout the world uh, keeping track of what's happening in the world. All that data is stored because storage has become very, very cheap. And so there's just a ton of data out there, a data deluge, as we like to say, um, that is available to train algorithms. And really, there's more data than we have time or energy to train algorithms. So we need to get better at creating algorithms at the same time. Um, another enabler is that computational power is cheap at this point. You know, the if you think about the, you know, the the power that you have in your pocket on your cell phone, um, that is an immense amount of computational power compared to even 10 years ago or 20 years ago, where that amount of computational power would have cost thousands and thousands of dollars, not just, I guess, $1,000, which I guess if you need the new iPhone, you got to spend a thousand bucks. Um, but, you know, it was like a supercomputer uh, not too long ago. And finally, there's a huge demand by industry. So industry has, has figured out uh, very quickly that machine learning is a way such that you can make good enough decisions to become very, very profitable uh, very quickly. Um, and the, you know, the kind of the quintessential example of that is Google. Google, Facebook, um, they really, they don't produce anything. They don't make anything, they don't really 
there's no th things that come out of those, although they've bought companies that do that now. Really what all that they do is they have an algorithm that allows, it's a machine learning algorithm that allows you to figure out based on a keyword, which website you want to find. Or, you know, based on, you know, you putting data into Facebook, um, spitting you ads. And so they really, they could care less how, how well things work for you. What they really want you to do is just use it and buy things based on the ads. And so ad, um, spitting ads at you day in and day out, um, manipulating you so that you buy stuff, uh, is is the industry uh, that Google and Facebook is and that's based on machine learning or figuring out how do we have somebody click on an ad can we figure out what what best ad to give them um, by tracking all their behavior it's a little scary once you get into the business um, so I I kind of see three niches of machine learning although an argument can be made that it's it's it's, it's more than this and you certainly wouldn't be wrong um, data mining, so using historical data to improve decisions is kind of the, the standard, what I would call the standard machine learning. So an example of that is taking medical records and translating that to medical knowledge. So making inferences based on measurements. So they're just measuring the, the glucose in your blood, um, you know, the, the records from your doctor visits and uh, putting that all together with uh, the aggregated medical records of the world and all of a sudden you can learn things about uh, our health and what we can do with that. That's obviously a huge thing right now with the, uh, the COVID-19 um, virus uh, causing uh, worldwide problems. Um, so machine learning has been a, a big part of that. Is how do we figure out, um, how do we make inferences from the small amount of data that we really have so far? Um, software applications that are difficult to program or solve by hand. Um, so for example, those, those examples are like the self-driving car, the, the autopilot, um, image classification. Um, so these things are certainly problems that could be solved by looking at the hardcore first principles physics. However, it would take an immense amount of energy, an immense amount of, um, you know, person time, uh, and computational power in order to solve all the physics that go into a self-driving car that can tell the difference between a pedestrian and a deer, which have two very different evasive actions. With a deer, you know, you don't want to swerve. We're all taught that when we drive. If you see a deer, you know, obviously slam on the brakes and try to uh, stop as fast as you can, assuming you have any lock brakes. Um, but if you see a pedestrian, you know, you need to you need to swerve, you need to not hit that person. So it's really, but how do you tell the difference? Well, that's, that's a very, very hard problem. Um, so machine learning gives, gives you a tool where you can just feed a whole bunch of data. So you could give a bunch of video of deer, a bunch of video of pedestrians, and the algorithm learns to tell the difference. Uh, image classification is another very difficult problem. How do you tell a computer from first principles physics to be able to tell the difference between the image of a cat and the image of a dog? You know, really, if you think about a cat and a dog, they have very, very similar body aspects. You know, they, they walk on four legs, they're furry and cute, although cute, you know, what does cute mean to a computer? They have two ears and a nose that sticks out the front and a tail and, you know, they're around humans all the time. However, machine learning is very, very good at telling the difference between these two things. And if you come on Wednesday when I do the deep learning talk, um, we'll do some image classification stuff. Um, that's kind of the, the realm of deep learning. User modeling. So this is the Google and the Facebook, you know, or Netflix and Amazon trying to sell you products. So automatic recommender systems, that's also machine learning. So just to give you a quick example, like credit, credit risk analysis. You know, your credit cards are using machine learning to determine or, you know, whatever the, the, the credit reporting agencies, how likely is somebody to pay back their debt. And that score that you have is based on those things. Although, you know, the machine learning doesn't come into as much because they're really worried about bias. But you could take all these aspects of somebody's life, you know, how many years they've had credit, what their loan balance is, their income, whether they own their house, et cetera, et cetera, and you could learn these rules. So for example, if you have another delinquent account, more than two of them, 
and the number of delinquent billing cycles is more than one, then you're not a profitable customer because you're not paying back your loans. You're just allowing them to accrue, accrue interest and that's fake money. So, so this is an example. Self-driving cars. Um, this Self-driving cars are on their way. There's a lot of challenges that need to be solved first, but even if self-driving cars were 1% more safe than humans, which actually isn't that difficult to do because humans are terrible at driving cars, then that would be great. So we shouldn't be worried about, you know, if self-driving cars come out and cause 100 or so accidents or deaths in humans. It's going to happen, but that's going to be way safer than humans driving cars. And so, um, you know, this is something that uh, the regulatory, it's more of a regula re regulation problem than it is a, a technical problem. I've ridden in self-driving cars. They seem to do great. So... Visual object recognition, classifying images. So how can you take in images of birds and other things and then have some model that is able to tell the difference between a bird and a non-bird image? And deep learning is really the, the tool of the trade here. Google image search. How does Google take the keywords that you put into image search and then find those images? Uh, not too long ago, the way that Google did it is they actually looked for keywords beside images, and those would be, be the images that they would give you. Nowadays, Google doesn't care about keywords around images. They actually use the image content to determine if you put in autonomous driving Google, which pictures come back to you. So they're using image recognition machine learning tools to do that. Software that models users, given your Netflix history, can Netflix figure out what to re recommend you um, based on your ratings of those three movies, 15 Minutes, Ali, and The Patriot? You know, are you going to get recommended Almost Famous or Atlantis? And it turns out, I guess it's recommending Atlantis. It's, this, is, this wouldn't be mine. Um, Almost Famous is a great movie. Uh, you look around me. So. The Netflix contest was something when I was a PhD student was huge. You know, they were offering a million bucks to somebody that could make a 10% improvement in their recommender system. And it turned out to be much harder um, than they thought. And the winner basically cheated because they used the, they trained on the, um, the leaderboard every day because you could submit once per day and see where you came in on the leaderboard so they could actually use that as the, as the objective function to improve the or to increase the amount of data that they implicitly had access to so heritage health prize is a recent one back in 2012 you could win three million dollars and so based on today after this seminar you should be able to go to kaggle.com which is a uh, a website where you can do machine learning competitions and start to make money by participating in uh, machine learning competitions. It's also a great place to get started. So they have a lot of beginner competitions at Kaggle where you can learn you know, the, the, uh, the aspects of machine learning that are necessary to be good at it. And it's not just knowing the algorithms, it's, it's like anything, it takes practice. Um, it's as much of a craft as it is a science. And I would actually argue that in practice, it's more of a craft than it is a science, um, especially when it comes to things like deep learning. So. Okay, there's a lot of relevant disciplines. So uh, depending on who everybody is on the call, um, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have time to, for me to learn everybody that's on. I think I saw like over 50 people. So um, we wouldn't get through the introductions in time. So if you're here, I guarantee your discipline probably could uh, benefit from machine learning. Basically every discipline can at this point. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's start to like dig into the nuts and bolts. So what is a learning problem? So machine learning is two things. It's machine and it's learning. So what are we gonna do with the machine? We're gonna do a learning problem. So learning is improving some task with experience. So, you know, if I turn to my piano and I play a little bit every day, which is you know, something that I do, I get better at it and that's because the more I do it, the more I listen to myself play, I learn little things about my playing, my fingers get better at moving, the muscles improve, all that. So that is learning. You do, it's something as humans we do very well. So you want to improve some task T. And so in this case, 
the task that we're going to do is we're going to take the IRIS data set, which is a very uh, classically used data set for introducing machine learning, and we're going to train a algorithm to tell the difference based on features, which are sepal length and sepal width and petal length and petal width. Um, so there's four flowers to tell the difference between those um, or three, those three flowers based on those four features. So that's the task. There's going to be some performance measure, P. In this case, uh, the classification performance measure is going to be accuracy. How often do you get the, the right class? And the experience, E, is usually the data itself. So you're going to look over the data, and um, you're going to train some algorithm as it goes through the data um, to get better. So let's just see a little example, learning to play backgammon. So the task here is playing backgammon. The, the P is going to be the percent of games won in tournaments. So you want a winning algorithm. And the experience is going to be playing against yourself. Algorithms can play against themselves because they don't communicate with themselves and, or others. So you could, you could play against human games in the past or uh, humans themselves or other algorithms. And so in backgammon, there's more than 10 to the 20th states or boards, which basically means that for all possible combinations of where um, your, uh, I forget what they call things in backgammon, the little tokens, um, they have a special name for it. Somebody can say it. Uh, there's, there's 10 to the 20th states. That's a ton. That's, that's a huge, huge, huge number. So you can't just implicitly or explicitly program a move for every possible state. Although, you know, that would be a, a great solution, but we can't do that. So because the best human players in the world that play every day in multiple games only see a very, very small fraction of all these boards during their lifetime. Both because there's a ton, there's a huge, that's a huge number, but also there's a lot of states that just don't make sense. You know, there's states that they, especially if they're good players and they're playing other good players that you wouldn't get into because good players don't make certain moves. So searching is hard because of the dice, and because, which have a branching factor of greater than a thousand, or excuse me, a hundred, which basically means that every time you roll the dice, you know, more than a hundred things could happen. And so every, for every move, for every board state, you have more than a hundred possible things that can happen from that board state. Is there a question? I see a chat. What does 2U stand for? Um, that's a 20. Whoops. Oh, shoot. Yeah, it's just a, a, a PowerPoint thing. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, George. OK. So TD Backgammon, which was invented by uh, Tesaro back in 1995. I'm sure a lot of you probably weren't even born. Um, I was. So TD backgammon, you have version zero up to version three, was a neural network. And you can see the number of hidden units, which is basically the complexity of the neural network, the number of games that the, the program trained on, the, the types of opponents that they had uh, for testing those. You can see, you know, the kind of the results here. So at first, TD backgammon 0.0, .0 was it was the best algorithm. So they came out and they said, okay, we're the best algorithm. However, then they said, well, what if we start to play some really good human backgammon players? And so you can see here, the results were that uh, TD backgammon lost 13 times in, in um, or negative 13 points, whatever that means at backgammon, over 51 games. So the humans were better. And that happened in version two and 2.1 as well, where they were playing grandmasters. I guess Roberti is probably one of the best grandmasters. And then, but finally, in TD Backgammon 3, Kazaros, which was the world's best player at that point, lost to TD Backgammon. So you can see it basically became as good as the, the human player. And this is back in 1995 um, with a very, uh, the computers weren't nearly as strong as what we have here. So machine learning is a powerful tool. AlphaGo, how many people have seen AlphaGo? If you haven't, you should go out and watch that movie. It's, it's uh, um, especially since we're all just staying at home, we have a lot of times to watch movies like this. So AlphaGo is a movie about um, the, the DeepMind projects, uh, 
program, which was, which was called AlphaGo, which was a computer that played Go. And so AlphaGo version Lee um, beat the world champion Lee Sedol, uh, the, the best player in the world, four to one by learning from historical data of Go tournaments. So it's a computer that uh, beat the best Go player. And so this was thought to be kind of the, the grand challenge of, of computers playing games because the branching factor of Go and the number of board states is just astronomical. I mean, you, you could have a computer the size of the universe and still not be able to accomplish um, the branching factor in board states with, with Go. So since then, you know, some, it didn't take for very long. Alpha Zero became the world's, perhaps the universe's, depending on uh, your belief, um, best Go chess and shogi player. Um, and it did this by starting from scratch and learning for 24 hours with no access to historical data. So you can think of is that Alpha Zero was a computer program that had no access to the outside world, just all, just this, this computer program that was built to accomplish a task and a very general task. Um, and it started playing against itself uh, and learned in 24 hours and became the best player in the world. So it not, was, not only was better than Lee Sedol, it was way better than AlphaGo Lee and AlphaGo's versions that came before that. So it, pretty astonishing technology. So we're on to the programming now. So in today's Python ex ex exercise, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a problem, we're gonna prepare the data for that problem, evaluate some algorithms, and I'm gonna show you how to do a whole bunch of different algorithms. This is something you could do in your research even. Um, learn how to improve the results perhaps, um, and, or just at least evaluate results so that we can think about improving them and how to, how to present those results. And we're gonna do this with the, the best beginner data set ever from machine learning called the IRIS data set. The reason it's great is because it's small, it's only 150 data points, you can look at it. Um, it's rather easy to work with. I know that everybody at the same time is gonna be able to work with this uh, data set and you can learn a lot of the tools. Um, if you, you know, if you're really interested in machine learning past this, you could take what you learn here and kind of go beyond it either by taking the class or uh, doing some online MOOC type classes, or there's a ton of tutorials out there. So let's go to um, the template. So what I did, I'm gonna stop sharing this right quick, is I gave a link in the chat window. And so you should be able to right click on that link and hit copy. And then you should be able to go over to your, let's see, this one. There we go. So go over to your window, paste that in, and it should open up and look like this. So I have two different um, Google Drive accounts working at the same time. So I'm, I'm able to kind of see, to show you what it, what it looks like. So it's, up here you should see changes will not be saved. So the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is you're, wanna get, you're gonna wanna go to file and say save a copy in Drive. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna save a copy in your drive and then open that up. And then, so this will be now a copy and it should see like copy of, of that uh, at the top. So this is now something that you can edit and uh, fool around with. So I'll give everybody a second to do that and then uh, we'll get started. Okay. I assume, I'm just gonna assume that everybody's here and your screen looks very much like mine. So this is a Jupyter Notebook. So a Jupyter Notebook is, is kind of the best. Uh, I got a question here. How do you save a copy in Drive? So what you do is you're gonna go up to File and Save a Copy in Drive. To answer your question, did it work? Okay, cool. 
So this, this is a Jupyter Notebook. And what's great about it is that you can kind of simultaneously have code, the results, and any text that you want to write all in the same place. So you can leave yourself notes and kind of more ideally, you can leave other people notes. So you can describe what you're doing, have the code, comment it, and have results all at once. So the first cell I have here, and these are called cells, loads all these different libraries. And so pandas and matplotlib um, Panda is a great data loader, so it makes it really, really easy to load data. Um, matplotlib is a great way of plotting things, and it's called that because it's based on MATLAB's plotting capabilities. And then sklearn is, is an excellent machine learning package. I would, I would say it's the you know, time-tested, mother-approved Python um, machine learning package. And so you can see here from each of these packages, I'm just importing a bunch of libraries, and these are the kind of the functions we're going to use. And so what you want to do is in the click in somewhere in the cell wherever you want and just hit shift enter shift enter and what you should see is you know there's a it runs and then finally if it ran you'll you'll see that little uh, bracket one at the top it may be a different number depending on if you've already if you kind of skipped ahead and we're doing other things and so the next thing we're going to do after we've and what this has done is it's run the code within that cell. So now this is running inside of um, Google's server somewhere. And you should see up here that it says RAM and disk. It's telling you how much uh, memory and disk you're using. And, and this also tells you that things are working. So now we're going to load the data with pandas directly from a website. So if you see this website right here, what this is, is this is the machine learning repository at uh, UCI. And so if you go to the machine learning repository, you could type that in Google if you want. You could find all kinds of data. This is the iris data. And so what this is loading from this URL, it's going to load these data. And then we're giving it the names of the four, five things that these data columns represent. And so it's sepal length, sepal width, petal length, pedal width and class. And then this read CSV is going to load the, uh, the data from there. Going too fast. Okay, so uh, what do you want? What do you want me to do again, specifically? The last run. Oh, you mean hit, hitting shift enter in this? Yeah, did you hit shift enter? And then you should see something like, like this uh, bracket one up there if it worked. You could do it as many times as you want. So if I hit it again, you can see a two there. That basically means it's just the second thing I ran. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, so we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit Shift Enter in this cell now, where it says Load Data Set, and it should load the data set. And this is a small data set, and so it should load pretty quick. So now we're gonna take a look at this data set. So what we want to look at the dimensions, um, take a look at the data, see what they look like, uh, statistical summary of the data, breakdown of the data by class variable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, you can also hit the little play button. That's true. It's the same thing. I always like key commands because as if you always if you learn the key commands first, you can learn to operate without mice, and that actually goes much faster. So, so uh, if we click down on shape of data here, and we hit Shift Enter there, and if you hit Control Shift Enter, it'll actually go to the next one. But Shift Enter is fine. Then you can see the output here. So this little thing right here, this little kind of square with the right hand arrow, it means output. So the shape of this data is 150 by five. That means there's 150 rows and five columns. And so recall up here the names. So these are the five columns, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width, and then the class. These, the first four are the features and then the class is going to be the types of flowers. 
And so now let's kind of look at the data itself to see what those numbers in that class look like. So if we hit shift enter in the look at the data itself, we'll see like this. And so what I'm, I'm just showing, you know, 20 of these. Uh, and so this, this is a pandas command, command, this dot head 20. It's just showing uh, the first 20 rows of this data set. So from row zero to row 19, and you can see the four numbers that go along with this, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and then the classes. Uh, be more specific. If you, uh, if you say you're getting an error, copy and paste it and put it in the chat window, or else I can't answer your question. I'm going to continue on while you're going to do that. So now you could also look at the statistics of the data set. So, so far here, this class, this is the thing that we're, we're going to want to, uh, so you must not have run this load data set cell. If it says data set is not defined, it means that you didn't run the second cell. So you have to keep up, make sure you're hitting shift enter in, in each of the cells. So now let's look at the statistics of the data set. What's great about, this is why I love pandas, is because it just makes it super easy. You, you have this, this pandas data set, and then dot describe does exactly that. It just describes the data. So if we click in this cell, use pandas to look at the statistics of the data set, you hit shift enter, and now this gives you some statistics about this data set, which is really just wonderful. So, Herve, did you get your uh, error fixed? So for example, the count, what this basically means is, is the number of things in each of these four features. We have 150 in each of these, which basically means there just aren't any missing entries. The mean is the mean of all the numbers. So this is the mean sepal length, the mean sepal width, the mean pedal length, pedal width, et cetera. And then some other things. So we have the standard deviation, the minimum number, the maximum number, and then the quartiles, the 25%, 50%, and 75%. So 50% would be median. So this, this is just good for looking at the data. And one, so some things that you could figure out about these data are if the numbers are wildly different, you might want to do something about it. And I'm not going to talk about that today, but you could do like normalization or something like that. So you kind of want the numbers on the same level. Um, so finally, okay, so now let's, let's look more into like, what do the data look like for each of the classes? Because that's what we're really interested in. You want to know, like, are these numbers, these four numbers, sepal length, sepal width, pedal length, and pedal width, going to allow us to tell the difference between the classes that we have or the types of flowers in that class column? So if we hit shift enter in what is the class distribution? So it's telling us there's 50 of each of the three classes. So that's kind of the first piece of information is saying, okay, okay how many different uh, sets of numbers do we have that describe these classes? So Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica are three different types of irises. And we have 50 of each of those irises. This is also why this, great, this data set is really great to use for beginners, because we don't have some problems um, like having features have different type ranges of values and or imbalances in the classes. So if you have imbalances in the classes, you can get into some more technical issues that, that are more advanced topics. So this is good. So there's some other things we can do in pandas. Um, we can look at the data types. So if we hit shift enter in the data types, we see that you know it's just the the type of, of variable. If you're computer sciency, you know these are float variables, and then these are the class is an object variable, which basically means it's just it's a word, um, and then it gives you the number of data types, the memory usage of this data set, and so on and so forth. You know, kind of more technical stuff. You could look for null value data. So are the data that are missing or don't have values? So in this case. If we shift enter on that, what we're ba basically looking at is the, the sum of the data set that is null uh, or missing, and all the numbers are zero, which great, which is great, which means we have a number for every single flower. We're not missing some data. Okay, 
now let's visualize the data. This is always the first thing you want to do in machine learning is try to visualize it. Try to learn about your data set before you try to do stuff with it. Some of the things that uh, get people in trouble with machine learning are just like throwing algorithms at data sets, getting results and saying, like, oh man, these results are great. These, these, this works really well without knowing anything about the data, which could have led you to believe that, okay, this algorithm wasn't, wasn't appropriate or there are underlying issues with the results. And those are kind of more advanced topics too, but that we, you just have to, this, this stuff, you know, takes a long time to, to get really good at, but this will, this will get you started. So box and whisker plots are one way. So if we're in the box and whisker plots uh, box there, hit shift enter. And you can see that this data set dot plot is going to plot a kind box, subplots equal true, layout two by two, which is the two by two subplots, um, share X and share Y equals false. So that just basically means that each of these subplots can have different X and Y um, axes, which you can actually see there. And then pyplot.show there just shows the plot. And so if we go actually back up to the top, what pyplot is, you can see this line from matplotlib import plyplot. That's the name of the, we just imported that as a name pyplot. So you could actually call that whatever you want. I've seen it called just plot. Um, but what we see here is just, it's a standard box plot, which shows the, the median and then the quartiles and the max and the min for each of the different uh, four features. And you, if you look back here at this data set to just describe, it would be the same values. It's just in a plot form. So we could look at histograms and you can see all this stuff is really, really, really easy. It's like one line of code. So if you look at the histograms of these data, you can see the histograms for the different features. And what a histogram shows you is like the distri distribution of the numbers. So you can see in petal length, there's a whole bunch of values that are up here between say three and, and about seven and some values that are down here between zero and two. Now, wouldn't it be great if these were two different classes? You know, remember we have three classes we don't quite know that yet, but we do know that there are some separations in the data, which may lead us to believe that this could be done with machine learning. So now let's look at a scatter plot. So hit shift enter in the scatter plot. And scatter plots are great because now what you're doing is you're plotting features against other features. So first, look at the diagonal of the scatter plot looks very, very much like the histograms, right? And in fact, it's the same plots. You can see, you know, this, this petal width plot is, is the right here. The petal length plot is uh, right here. And then we have sepal length and sepal width, which are these two. But the other plots, what they're doing is they're, this plot in the upper, in the first row in the second column is plotting all the numbers of sepal length versus sepal width. So you can see, you know, how the features might have correlations between them. So look at these two, pedal length and pedal width. You can see as pedal length increases, so does pedal width. And so there's definitely some correlations in these data and it just can lead you to have a better understanding of the behavior of the numbers that you have. Okay. Another great data exploratory tool that I like is called the Seaborn um, package. And so now we're down here and you should see something that says import Seaborn as SNS. So hit shift enter on that one. It's going to import the Seaborn package. It's great. Um, it makes things really easy. And now I'm, I'm doing more things at once because we're, we're getting good at hitting shift enter. Um, so just hit shift enter in this bigger cell that starts with a pairwise plot of the features. So if we hit shift enter on that, it, it'll compute, it takes a little bit longer. But what you should see now is you can see this sns.pairplot data set is the way of doing the same scatter plot matrix that we did with pandas and matplotlib with scatter matrix it's just a different command with Seaborn. So it's the, it's the same thing. This 
plot is the same plot as this. It just is plotted with C barn as opposed to uh, pandas. So this is great. It, it allows us to look at the data. And so another way of looking at that is a heat map. So you can look at the heat map of the correlation between the pairwise features. If features are correlated, the more correlated they are, the, the less likely that using those two features together are going to give you power in separating classes because they basically just represent the same thing. That's what correlation means. And so this heat map down here, what this is showing is for each of the four features, just the correlation of those features. So you can see on the diagonal, you see all the ones. That's because a feature is perfectly correlated with itself. The numbers are the same. Off the, uh, then the, in the off diagonals, if you see this, you know, this is the color map going from negative 0.4 to, to, to 1, you can see that there's quite a lot of correlation between petal length and petal width. And you can see there's the same labels on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. And we saw that in this, these, uh, this pairwise scatter plot too. There's, the more diagonal this, this is, the, the more correlation there's going to be, and that's represented there. Then you, but what you do see is there's not a lot of correlation. In fact, there's, a, there's negative correlation between sepal width and these, these petal length and the, the, the sepal length. So sepal width is, is a feature that is showing different data than the other features. So it's probably an important feature. And finally, in um, this, this sepal length, you see that it's, it's much different from sepal width because it's sepal width is kind of different from everything, but it has some correlation with petal length and petal width. And if we go up here, we would see that too. If we, if we look at sepal length and then petal length and petal width, you see these, these diagonal lines again, like that. Okay, finally, now we're getting to the good stuff. We're gonna do a pairwise plot of features but with the classes shown. So we're gonna plot the classes in different colors so we can start to see, okay, do these classes end up in different places on the plots if we start to look at these numbers? And so what I'm gonna do, this is kind of a complicated uh, Python command, but what the backslash allows me to do is just continue a command. So I kind of put this on multiple lines so you could show it all at once. This facet grid, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take the data set and it's going to set the hue of each of those uh, markers by the class. And so that's the type of flower that it is. So we have three different flowers. So we should see the three different colors there. Then it's going to use the scatter plot to look at sepal length and just sepal width, just those two. And then we're going to add a legend. And so you can see, you know, once you start to get good with Python, it, it, it's very, very, you can read it almost like a, a sentence. And then we're going to show that, um, that plot. So here you can also see we're mixing Seaborn and Matplotlib together too, which is cool. OK, so you should see a little plot right here that's showing sepal length versus sepal width. So it's just taking those numbers for each of those flowers, the sepal length and the sepal width, plotting those together. And then the color indicates the type of flower that they came from. So one thing you should notice right away is that there's a lot of blue flowers up here in this little blob. And then the orange and green flowers are down here. So the Versicolor and Virginica are kind of all mixed together. But the Sestosas are far apart. So I could take a line, draw right between those pretty much, except for this maybe this blue guy down here, and say stuff on one side of the line is Versicolor and Virginica, stuff on the other side of the line is Sestosa. Man, I have a pretty good classifier just by looking at the data, but we're going to do better than that. So now what I want you to do is, whoops, did I, um, oh no, okay. Create your own pairwise class plot for pedal length and pedal width. And so the, I was going to have you type in the, the um, code here, but I started, I did some timing runs and found that it was going to take too long. So hit shift enter on this next one to look at now, rather than plotting sepal length and sepal width against each other, plot petal length and petal width against each other. And now you see furthermore that this Setosa class 
is very different from these other two classes. And also, unlike the petal length and petal width where the Bursa color and Virginica were all mixed together in this plot, you start to see those separate out. So there's the orange in the middle and the green up at the top and the blue all the way down here. This right away starts to tell you that, okay, using machine learning, we should get some pretty good classification results on these data. And you will see that that is true. So you could, you could uh, plot, plot petal length against uh, petal width. So if we, you know, or excuse me, sepal length. So we could change this to sepal length right there and do another plot. And you can see that each of these plots is actually one of the plots from these, these pairwise plots. That's so all that we're doing is we're taking all the different permutations of that pairwise plot there and just putting different colors for the different classes. And so it's just a different way of looking at the data. And so I include some other cells here, which you know, I'll, I'll invite you to, to do on your own. There's the violin plots. We don't need to run those right now. Um, I left a, a, a little box here where I said, hey, why don't you take the code from the violin plots and make box plots. And all that you need to, to do there is just change the word violin plot to box plot. Everything else stays the same and you get box plots. So if we look at violin plots, you know, this is what a violin plot looks like. And I invite you kind of offline to look at what those might be. But now what we want to do is we want to get into the machine learning. So we've looked at the data. First thing that you want to do with machine learning is you want to take your data set that you're given, split it up. So you want to take some data away and store it in a locker somewhere and don't touch it. Because those data are what you're going to use in the end in order to, to determine whether your machine learning algorithm actually worked. You never want to determine whether your machine learning algorithm is working on the training data. You want to keep that validation of data away. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking 20% of the data and or 30 of the, the different uh, data sets and I'm randomly just taking them away. So if we hit shift and enter on that, uh oh, I got a syntax error. Oh, that's because I included some things for us to, to, to fill in here. So got ahead of myself. So the, here, what we want is the features are the four values that are the sepal length, sepal width, and pedal length, and pedal width. So we're going to take those and call those x. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do colon, comma, 0, colon, 4. And what that tells Python is we're going to take every row of the array, which is the data set dot values, and then take 0, colon, 4, which actually means 0 to 3. It's weird. Which is the, the four features. The class is going to be colon, comma, 4. So we're going to take the fourth column as the class. Then we're going to hit Shift Enter. OK. So that worked. So now we have some data that we've held out. And those are called X validation and Y validation, where X are the features, the four numbers that describe the flower. Y are the classes or the type of flower that it is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to train a whole bunch of different models. And I've included some descriptions of those models here, logistic regression, linear discriminant analysis, blah, 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 and support vector machines. There's a lot of different ways that you classify these data. What I'm showing you here in this cell that starts with build an array of classifier models is a way that you can do this all at once. So what's going to happen here is you're going to build uh, an array of different models. And some of them have some, some uh, different arguments there. And then we're going to evaluate each of those models in turn by using what's called cross-validation. So cross-validation separates your training data into different chunks, trains on part of it, and then tests on a part that's held out, and then does this in a round-robin fashion. In this way, in this one, I've, I've done tenfold cross-validation, which separates the data into 10 chunks, trains on nine, tests on one, and then does this at round robin such that you're testing on all 10 chunks by training on the other nine. So this is a way you can estimate how good your classifier is going to work in the real world, or in this case, on that validation data that we held out. So if you hit shift enter on this, this cell, build an array of classifier models, you should, this happens really fast, you should now get six numbers. 
The first number of these six numbers is the average accuracy or how well this predicted the classes based on the numbers for each of these six machine learning models. And then the parentheses number is the standard deviation. And so what it's doing is it's taking those 10 different trials that it did in that cross validation, averaging how well it did over those 10 trials, and then looking at you know, how, how the standard deviation tells you how consistent it was over those 10 trials. So we want this to be a big number. So if we look at these, you can see SVM gives 98% accuracy. So support vector machine ends up to be the best one. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, a box plot of this. And I'm going to, so here what we want to do is we want to look at a box plot of the results. And we want the labels equal names. So it's going to make a box plot of these results, these six numbers, and then with the labels, uh, the names of each of those classifiers. Let's make the title of this uh, comparison. And finally, we're going to show that. Uh-oh. Result is not defined. Oh, that should be results. OK. So what this plot is showing is a box plot of the accuracy for all the six of the algorithms. So you can look at this and compare. And so right away, you see SVM is the best. So most of the time, it was perfect. There was one outlier where it got 92.5%. And that's what this dot means, is that it's detected an outlier. I'm not going to get into like how it does that. But you can see the other ones, you know, they weren't as good. And some of them had, you know, pretty these small accuracies down here, like the, the logistic regression and the naive Bayes models. So now what we're going to do is we're going to choose the SVC model or the SVM model, same thing, and go back to our validation data and test it. So the results are, are defined up here in this big cell, build an array of classifier models. What the results are is just the accuracy of the 10 different trials that we tested each of those classifier models with the cross validation. So that's how those are defined. And accuracy is simply the, the number that you get right divided by the total number. That's, it's very, very simple. So now we're, let's go back and make some predictions on our validation data set. So in here, we want model equal SVC, which is the code for SVM, go figure. Um, gamma equals auto. And that's just setting a parameter in that. And so now we want to train that model. So we define the model. We're going to do model dot fit x train y train. So now you can see we're using the whole training data set to define this model rather than just doing the cross validation. Title missing one required positional argument label. If you just Copy what I did here, just use a, a single quote with a word inside that title, it'll work. So here, try this. So that, that allows us to train the model. And now what we want to do is make the predictions on the validation data sets. So we're going to do predictions equal model dot predict x underscore validation. So we're going to give it the, the values from the validation data set and predict on those. And so now if, you, if your cell looks like this, you should be able to hit shift enter. And then we're going to print out some results from testing this SVM model on the validation data. OK. So on the validation data, the first thing that we did is we're going to print the accuracy score on that validation data. And the way we're going to do that is accuracy score takes as arguments y validation, which is the right answer, and then the predictions, and just compares those. So our SVM model on that validation data that we held out at the very beginning and didn't touch till now was 97%. That is awesome. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to print what's called the confusion matrix. This could take the same arguments, the right answer, and the predictions that we got. A confusion matrix is simply, for each of the three classes, it's going to look at how well did it, did it predict. So the, the rows are the, the correct class, 
and then the columns are what the classifier predicted. So you can see for the cystosa, for all 11 of those 30 that it uh, was in the validation data set, it correctly predicted 11 of them. For the versicolor, there was 13, because you can see this little pesky one over here. Uh, there was one that was predicted as versicolor instead of vir virginica. And then finally, uh, versicolor, all six versicolors were predicted correctly. So it only made one error. And if we go back, you know, we can look at, we can look back here at, at these. This is the Cestosa, Versicolor, and Virginica plots. What, what it is, is it's probably one of these pesky green ones that is overlapped here between the orange and the green. That's, that's in, if we go back to the original of plotting petal length versus petal width, you can see there's, there's just a few in there that are, that are overlapped. And, but the SVM is actually using all four dimensions at the same time. And we can't imagine four dimensional space. We can't plot it, so we couldn't look at it. So there's only one of those orange ones is being classified as a green one. So I, I take it, that's no problem. And then finally, classification report gives you a full report on the results, including precision, recall, F1 score, so precision is accuracy. Recall is a, a different way of looking at it. Um, I'm not going to go into all, all of those. F1 score is kind of a good overall. Um, so it's actually the, uh, the, the geometric uh, mean of precision and recall. So it kind of considers both of those. Support is just simply the number of each of those classes that you considered. And finally, accuracy, 97% overall 30, um, and then you know, some averages on those, those numbers. So overall, that classification report gives you an overall view of the, the classifier. So look at that, it's 5 p.m. Um, right on time, we've gotten to the end. Uh, I invite you to, to do some, some things with this. For example, you know, one of the things you could do right away is try to run this uh, for one of the other classifiers. That, that we chose. So you could choose this up here. Um, let's say logistic regression. So what you can actually do is you can just copy and paste this and say, okay, if we cut and paste that, so control C, go down here, put that there, and say model equals logistic regression. We'll take these, all this stuff from here down there and then so you could actually take your logistic regression classifier and, and test that on your validation data set so I shift enter there so you can see the logistic regression results kind of similar to what we saw with the box plot up here where logistic regression wasn't nearly as good as SPM we see that also in this that it's it got only 83 percent accuracy and it made five mistakes with that that uh versicolor class as opposed to just one mistake. So, so you could do that with all, of, all six of those classifiers, continue to do that to, to get a, a comprehensive view if you want. Now, typically you can't do these with huge data sets and that's why, you know, the, we usually what we want to do is just use this cross-validation approach to choose a classifier and or parameters for that classifier because it gets even deeper than this. Um, and then finally, you're going to have to field some algorithm. And that's, this, that's what I'm showing here. It's like, okay, this is the algorithm that you want to give to your customer in order to make um, flower classifications. So, okay, so I'm going to, so you should at this point have a, a notebook that works pretty well. Um, I'm going to give you a copy of my full notebook at the end here so that you could take a copy of this. Hold on, let me see. Copy link, I'm gonna put it in the... So this is, this link that I just posted in the chat has, has everything. So it's um, everything all filled in. So if you want, if, if for some reason you got some errors as, as we were going along, you could, you could, uh, take that one and, and compare and, and, and figure it out.
I, I have some time if, if people have questions. Um, I also invite you on, on Thursday. What, what time is it on Thursday? Um, it's 2.30 p.m. Thursday. 2.30 on Thursday, we're going to do a deep learning. And so it'll be very, very similar. Um, I'm most likely going to use, I haven't decided which tutorial I kind of want to go through. I have a few of these worked up. I think I'm going to do what's called the MNIST um, data set. It's, it's a little bit bigger data set, so there might be some homework ahead of time to get things so that we can get it rolling. Um, but uh, what it is, is uh, it's, a, it's a classic deep learning data set, and the images are numbers that were taken off zip codes from post, from uh, letters, you know, addresses from the post office. So uh, it, it will, I, I use pandas for a lot of stuff, so um, I may or may not, it, it, really, it really depends. So TensorFlow has the MNIST data set built right in so you don't really have to use pandas, but um, so a question: How do Python and R compare to each other? What are the differences? Um, that's a good question, and there are a lot of similarities. Uh, certainly, a lot of things that you can do in Python you can do in R. I think everything we did today we could do in R. Um, I'm. I have never used R for anything deep learning, uh, so I don't have any experience with that. So I really can't comment on that and 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 what the how good it is or what the support level is for it. Um, I think Python is more popular in the machine learning community, and so you're going to find more uh, help or built-in libraries. Uh, open source solutions for things with Python than you will with R. R is an exceptional package for statistics. Like if you're doing a lot of statistics stuff, um, R, that's how, that's what R was built for. So if, if you're getting more into like hardcore data mining things um, where you're doing more statistical analysis on large data sets, R is great. Um, I like Python. I pretty much do everything in Python. I don't use R for anything. But it's a tool. You know, everybody has their favorite tool. So. I'd love to, Sergio, but I'm not done with it yet. I'll be honest that I do things kind of at the last minute. Because that's kind of the time that I have. Okay, so oh, things got fast. This model predicted the class, how to convert this to doing a continuous value estimate. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to say, you know, predict how many, estimate how many miles an, an African swallow uh, could carry a coconut um, or something, uh, or, you know, say the, predict the size of a shrubbery, um, then you are doing regression. So regression is like classification, except for the output variable is a continuous variable, like uh, say a size or a measurement, um, rather than classification where the output is a, a categorical variable. Um, so what's different between regression and classification is typically classification classes don't exist in some measurable space. So you can't measure the, the distance between versicolor and setosa. I mean, it just there's, it's not a measurable space. Um, where in regression, the, the outputs exist on some continuous, uh, continuous space, so you actually can um, say, say the difference, or you can measure error in a different way. Um, one of the things that we're, we're doing quite a quite a bit recently is, is regression in, in a lot of my research. Uh, for example, we're using regression in a Ford Motor Company project where we're trying to uh, predict uh, performance of batteries in, in hybrid cars. And so the output variable is not binary. It's not like a good or a bad battery. It's a, a score of, of the battery. Um, and so regression algorithms are different. Uh, and so if you Google um, regression algorithms in scikit-learn, in fact, let me see if I can 
sk learn regression. I'll just put a, a link there. Then you could do very much the similar things like the, the stratified cross validation idea with regression models. Um, and 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 do do that. Let me see if I can find a good link for you. Here's a li linear regression. Oops. Oh, shoot. Example. Okay. Just a short comment on Python. Python can do other things except statistics as well. It is a programming language as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Python is a programming language. Yep. <laughs> True can, yeah. I, I, I love the chat in these virtual seminars. I hate not being able to hear anybody. Um, Sai, you're getting an error. Uh, so Sai, you probably didn't, you need to run something where you to load the data set. Um, that's, if, if it says data sets not defined, then you just need to rerun it up earlier when it was loaded from that URL. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions from you? Uh, can, I, can I ask my question over the mic? Yeah, sure. You have to turn on your video though, Isa. Sorry? You have to turn on your video. Oh, okay. That's, that's the rule. It's I need okay. to see, you know, I, I get lonely. I need to see people's faces. So can you see me now? Mm -hmm. Let me see myself. Okay. Hello, nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you as well. So uh, back to your answer to the regression question. Uh, I want to make sure that my understanding is uh, correct. So uh, the way that I learned was like classifying, you know, and regression are different. But uh, when you want to actually do classifications, uh, underlying algorithms are basically some sort of regression, but there are some activations functions which discretize your predictions. Right. Correct? You are correct. Okay. Yep. So yeah, so you, sure right. right. If you dig into the mathematics, like everything boils down to linear regression. Everything. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but everything in machine learning, let's say that. Perhaps everything. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot insist more, right? Right, right. Hi, Jordan, do you have another question? I did, yes, that'd be great. So um, I'm, I'm doing some soils work, and so we're working in hyperspectral data and doing predictions and stuff, and we're trying to estimate the soil strength. So that's why I was asking about the African swallow. Um, I was wondering for, with this as well, do you have a recommendation for a library when it comes to image classification in itself? So would you recommend scikit-learn still, or would you recommend going somewhere else? So if I have an image, a live feed, and I see a shrubbery, and I want to say, okay, that's a shrubbery, but that's a bush. Totally different, right? I need to be able to distinguish between the two. What software could do that with me giving it an image besides scikit-learn, or what one would you recommend? So I, I would come on Thursday to the session if you can, because um, we're going to talk about that specifically. And I use Keras. I think Keras is the easiest way to, to get into deep learning. Um, it's really, really straightforward. Um, it sh can be a little tricky to get it to kind of work. Um, but uh, overall, it's, it's got all the existing deep learning architectures. and. We'll talk a little bit more, more about this stuff on, on Thursday, but one thing I would, if I were you, is look into is using transfer learning um, with a, a deep architecture that's used for ImageNet. So there's, so there's these really big architectures in deep learning that have tens of thousands of parameters in them, and they take tons of energy and tons of time in order to train these things. And, what they're typically trained on is this data set called ImageNet. And it's there's these millions and millions of images, and there's a thousand different classes, like cat, dog, cell phone, blah, 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 person. Um, and so, 
but you can download the trained networks for, for ImageNet, like ResNet is one, there's ResNet 50, ResNet 101, there's VGG, um, Inception, Exception, there's all these different network architectures that you can just download and they're already trained to do this task. So what you can do is you can actually uh, chop off the back end of these networks, the thing that makes the final decision of what class there is, add on your own architecture in order to make the decision you need and use all that energy that Google expended, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars of energy, um, and train something within a few minutes in order to get a good classification. Um, that's called transfer learning. We do this all the time. In fact, that computer behind me right now is, is doing that right now. Um, I have a classification problem where I need to classify um, laser, uh, laser radar, um, LIDAR point clouds. Yeah. And I am using ResNet 101 which was originally trained to do a completely different task, um, but I took the pieces of it I needed, and then I added other pieces such that I could do the task I needed it to do. Because when it really comes down to it, you know, whether you're trying to detect something in a point cloud or detect something in an image or classify an image, it's all the same. You're looking for shape, you're looking for texture, you're looking for patterns in the data. And so it, it all boils down to the kind of the same similar thing. So you kind of, you, you piggyback on what other people have done in order to do what you need to do. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds great. So I will, I will definitely look into that though. Here's some transfer learning then. And I'm, and I am coming Thursday, so. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. How do we get to dig into the statistics if we're interested in? So Kazim, what do you mean by the statistics of what? Kazim, you can unmute yourself and speak. Okay. I mean the statistics behind the data mining concepts and algorithm. So supposing I'm, I'm more interested in the statistics, how do I get to fetch like good materials that would lead me through the statistics? Yeah, you know, I think that the easiest way for you to get into that is, you know, take the machine learning course um, here. Mm -hmm. at um, take statistical learning in the math department. That's probably even, even really a better way to, to if, the, if you're interested in the statistical methods. Uh, so uh, okay. statistical learning, I think there's like a multivariate statistical learning class too. So I recommend all my graduate students to take as much math as possible. Um, because when it comes down to it, any of the things that we're doing as graduate students, especially in science and engineering, um, it's all math. And so if you get really, really good at the, the first principles, mathematical concepts, like the other stuff tends to come much, much easier than trying to go the other way around, where you're trying to understand something and design new tools without having an understanding of the mathematics behind it. Okay. And another so, comment is um, if you like to attend tomorrow, we have data mining with our seminar, so you can attend to that as well tomorrow at 4 p.m. Hey. Mm, do you guys have any other questions? Uh, if you have any questions, then you can forward them to me, or if Dr. Uh, then I can forward them to Dr. Havens, or if Dr. Havens uh, willing to answer your questions, then you can directly email him. Yeah, you can just email me if that's fine. Um, hope everybody's staying safe, staying healthy. Um, be good. So. And. Thank you, Dr. Havens, for the wonderful seminar. So, um, Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thanks.